Yes, well, now it is time for me to go to my esteemed guest, isn't it? I want to go and speak to the never-ending tidal wave of intellectual talent that we have here with my superstar panel. I'm sure that some of those will think differently than I do about the situation. With me now and joining me throughout the show is said superstar panel. We've got political commentator Georgia Elgil Holly, comedian Tommy Sandu, and journalist and commentator Sophie Corcoran as well. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. I want to start with what's happening in Afghanistan at the moment. And, Sophie, I'm going to start with you. Do you not think it looks a little bit like we are caring more for the lives of Afghan dogs and cats than we are for actual Afghan people? Yes, definitely. Uh, you know, there's no question that dogs and cats are important. But at the end of the day, these dogs and cats are going to probably end up to the same fate that these people are, and that fate is being subjected to the Taliban. We owe it to these Afghan people to protect them, and this idea that we should be flying home dogs and cats before real human beings, it doesn't matter how important these animals are. Humans, in my eyes, will always come first. Yeah, Tommy, I'm going to throw over to you now. What's your take on that, really, just in terms of the botched evacuation as a whole? It's hard, isn't it? Because we're, what we're now comparing is we're comparing human life versus animal life. And that's the debate we're having with it. Well, which one, which one would you choose? Mm. We're a nation of pet lovers. We naturally want to see those helpless animals put into a safe place. But then we've left all these people behind. I just think it's... Um, I think we have a duty. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of with you, I think, on this as well, Patrick. I think we have a duty to look after uh, the Afghan refugees as best we can. We, um, we need to step in as a big brother. It's kind of, it is a big brother thing here. It's a bit like when you have to look after your little brother at a, at a party. And you don't want to, you're like, oh, man, do I have to? It's kind of like, you know, it's getting, I've got my own fun I want to have. And I know there's a lot of Brits that are having that attitude of like, well, what about us? And these councils can't take it. And how do we deal with this? But the fact is we've got to step up. We've got to do what mm. we can. The animals are safe, but it's just, it's a, a horrific story as to what the fate, the future holds for those people that are left behind. George, do you think people will be inclined to be very welcoming to these Afghan refugees? We're already seeing, of course, aren't we, significant levels of illegal immigration coming over the channel. I did raise the issue there with homeless veterans as well. Do you think that people are going to be inclined to potentially even open their own doors to some Afghan refugees? Um, I think we, if you've been reading the news over the past few days and the past few weeks, there are already schemes in place by the government um, that will help accommodate those uh, refugees and asylum seekers. And there are uh, voluntary, so not government schemes, uh, private sector schemes, encouraging people to even open rooms of their own houses and apartments or wherever to house those refugees if local councils are mm. able to cope with them, which seems to be the case in a small number of councils. Um, I think if you're asking me, will British people be welcoming? Um, we can see historically, recent hist in recent history, that um, the UK is one of the most welcoming countries in Europe and, by extension, the world when it comes to um, immigrants, refugees, asylum seekers. So, of course, there will be maybe extreme elements mm. who wouldn't necessarily be personally welcoming. I think most people, whatever their opinions on immigration were, are, mm. would be inclined to be welcoming, of course, to individual people, as everyone should be. Um, yeah, Sophie, I'm just going to throw it back to you there. What do you think? Because I actually, later on in the show, I went out and uh, earlier on, I went out and uh, interviewed the great British public. I always like to have their views on, uh, on all matters like this. And, um, and one of the topics that I asked them about was whether or not they would be willing to accept an Afghan refugee into their own homes. And actually, quite a lot of them said yes. I mean, I'm wondering what your take on that was. Well, look, it's all good when they say we're going to house these people in our homes. We've got veterans sitting on our streets. My question is, how sustainable is this? Mm. Because these are real lives. Can these people be living in spare rooms in somebody else's houses and their kids can't fit in schools? How sustainable is this? How are we going to make it sustainable? Because housing people in random as neighbours' houses, you know, trying to fit 40 kids to a classroom, it's not... You know, they need to be able to live a good and proper life. So how sustainable is this actually physically going to be? We can be as welcoming and as loving as we want as a country, and I'm sure all of us want to help these people out, but how are we going to do it? Is it going to work? And we need to be honest about that. It doesn't matter how much we want to help these people, it's whether we're actually going to be able to and make a real difference and have it work. Yeah, it's, it's the practicalities of it. And, and Tommy, you're just going to throw back to you now, really, and say, are you concerned a little bit now, by virtue of us being out of Afghanistan, that the terror threat might have increased here, that now we're going to see potentially a hotbed of terror in the Middle East yet again, that they can start planning attacks over here, can't they? No, I think that's uh, I think it's kind of laughable, if I'm really honest. I think these are people that have, have left behind everything. They've come here because they have nothing. These people are, uh, have come here to save their lives. 
uh, I think for us to worry about, oh, are they going to secretly start to you know, develop their own little militant groups here? That's ridiculous. I think we've got a lot more concerns uh, to deal mm -hmm. with in this country. We've got to step in. We've got to help these, uh, these, these poor people out. Um, but obviously, councils need to be sustainable. I think the, the point Sophie makes is very right. These are real lives. These are, we've got to have a full plans in place uh, to look after these people. But mm. uh, as to sorry, as to whether they should come into individuals' houses and things like that, that just feels that feels like a real short-term measure. Uh, and besides, I think these people have been through enough. I don't think they need to come into my house. My house oh. is chaos. Well, it's, I spoke, it's, it's to Dominic, I spoke, to, my house. spoke to Dominic Raab live on GB News earlier this week, and I asked him a flat out, would you actually allow an Afghan refugee to live in your house? And he said no, because he's got a young family, whatever that really means. But I just want to move away from the Afghan issue, because we're going to be returning to it throughout the show. We're going to be going head-to-head -head on this. We're going to be doing the clash on it as well, which is whether or not we should maintain a military presence in Afghanistan, given the rather unsightly scenes that we've seen there recently. Recently. I want to talk about something a bit closer to home, George. I want to talk about vaccines. Now, we're blessed tonight, aren't we? We've got two real live youths in the studio with us here, real life youngsters, and an old geezer as well. No, I'm only joking, Tommy. I'm only joking, Tommy. <laughs> no, and I want to know from you first, Georgia, what's your take on the idea that potentially, anyway, potentially 12 year olds would not need parental consent to get the vaccine? What's your thoughts on that? I would say that personally, I believe um, for children, it should be up to their parents whether they get it or they don't. However, I know there's been a lot of, I guess, heat around this in the press today and prior prior to today in, in the media. Um, I would say that while I do disagree with um, people, uh, children getting it without their parents' consent, it wouldn't be a new thing for that to happen. You know, um, children can now do many things without parental consent, medically, um, contraception, for example, um, in schools, they can get access to it through school nurses, that kind of thing. So that's just one example, um, which is, I guess, caused controversy because of certain philosophies and religions' views on contraception. Um, and I guess children being involved in needing that is a controversial issue or a social issue. Um, so while I have my okay. own personal views on it, and I understand why it's causing a storm this week, it's really nothing new that no. kind of systems existed. Already. So, so yeah, Tommy, so, so you're, you're a parent. I mean, what was your take on it? Would you like your child to come home one day having had a vaccine without them asking you first? That's right, Patrick. I'm old enough to be a parent. <laughs> right? We've established that, Patrick. No. Um, no. You're old enough to be a grump now. I'll <laughs> yeah. leave it. I'll leave I'm, I'm, it. I'm old enough to be both these guys' parents, that's for sure. Um, no, uh, I would not be happy. I think, let me just tell it how it is. Mm. You young people, you think you know, you don't know, okay? You don't <laughs> know yet, and you won't know. And I'm still learning, I'm 44. You keep learning all throughout your life. And I think young people, uh, we know the numbers have been, have been very low on the way uh, infections have worked with, uh, with young mm. people with coronavirus, and particularly, uh, fatalities as a result of it my my sons roll around in the mud in the dirt they pick up germs they're snotty most of the time they're coughing and spluttering most of the time I, they probably had covid 10 times over in the it's last no, it's no months. it's no wonder an afghan refugee will come around to your house exactly he's like forget that <laughs> not the sandu house any any i'll take any other one uh, but I, I i just don't think they're old enough to make the decision my son when he's playing the switch he doesn't even need to know that he doesn't even know that he needs to pee he's playing with his legs crossed i can see him around like you need to pee he's like no i don't Yes, I do. So I have to tell him that. How can this guy tell me that he can have a vaccine? No, OK, Sophie, what's your view on it now? Do you think that the role of the parent is being diminished in the home? Yep, and I think anybody that thinks this vaccine rollout is going to be, you know, nice, um, look at the way they treated my generation. Look at the tactics they've used for people like me, using our education as a weapon. They've used our freedom as a weapon, the freedom that we gave up to protect other people. Mm. If you don't think they're going to do this to your kids, then wise up because they will. And don't be shocked when they will. I do think... So you don't believe them? You don't believe the government when they say, because at the moment the line is, look, hey, we will be going for your parental consent, but you just don't believe that's true? No, look at the lines in this pandemic. It's been moving goalpost of after goalpost after goalpost and we've allowed this to happen realistically whether somebody gets a vaccine or not they can do it i think you know using natural immunity has been said that it's you know would be better for young people to build up their natural immunity mm. but in reality to have a 12 year old a, a child they're not even teenagers they are children to say that they can have a vaccine please they don't know what's in this vaccine they don't know what the effect is it has and well, there will well, be well yeah pressure. i mean it's, it's important to say well, whilst i think there is certainly a concern about long-term data or lack of and that's to use the middle management speak where well, we are where we are when it comes to that kind of thing uh, but actually i mean so far the, the the negative side effects have been relatively minimal sophie yep but so have the risks for young people for COVID. What is the rush? 
if they can build up natural immunity as they do with the flu, as they do with other things, why are we going to force these kids to have a vaccine that some of them, many of them don't want just to try and fulfil some sort of political agenda? It's politicised at this point. It's not a matter of health because we know for a fact that young people aren't as susceptible to this virus as the others. And the choice should be there. But what shouldn't be there, Patrick, is the coercion, the manipulation and the blackmail that has happened to my generation and will okay. inevitably happen to this as well. OK, just quickly now, I want to hit another topic that we're going to be discussing later on in the show, and that's relating to Extinction Rebellion. Now, Boris Johnson is believed to have referred to them as uncooperative crusties. I could possibly never be as unkind as that. I just want to hear from you, Georgia, on this. Do you care about the impending end of the world? <laughs> That's a bit of a loaded question, and I think that Extinction Rebellion would probably um, be in favour of the way you loaded that question. Of course, I'm concerned about environmental damage in general, mm. pollution, and of course, climate change. Um, climate change motivated by, uh, or cause rather, obviously we're not going to give climate change some sort of sentience, um, mm. uh, caused mm. by human activities and industry. However, I think that a lot of the doomsday predictions that are peddled by extreme uh, groups like Extinction Rebellion, they do go over the top and I think that some of their violent protest tactics well, are let's just, let's just Yeah, let's just pick up on that. So, Tommy, just, you know, some of the things that have been going on on the Capitol streets are criminal damage and yet our police officers, okay, it turns out they've arrested apparently around 200 uh, of the Extinction Rebellion lot. It's important to say as well that not everyone in Extinction Rebellion or Animal Rebellion is, is, is behaving like that. Some of them are just there and, and voicing their concerns as you can in a free and democratic society. However, some of them are also committing criminal damage. Would you like to see us be a bit tougher on those people? You've got to be, because that can't be an option. Once you open up the floodgates to, to saying to people, well, if you want your point really made, go out there to the streets. And the problem is, these people aren't being heard. They, or they feel they're not being heard. They feel their points aren't being taken seriously, which is why they're going to these kind of extremes. Mm. So I think something, there's something in the management process of this whole debate, of these arguments, has to be done earlier on, where people feel like they've got to have a, an outlet to their points. If they're not getting the outlet, they're going to take to the streets. If they're going to take to the streets, damage is going to be done. But look, here we are talking about them, so um, mission ob objective Well, absolutely, achieved. hey, you know, we're, we're, we're raising their cause, I suppose, in, in that sense. I do think that the police, in my personal opinion anyway, could maybe spend a bit less time painting rainbow flags on the side of their cars and maybe a bit more time actually tackling violent crime and, and, uh, and issues on the streets. But anyway, we move on. Yes, oh, well, I thought that was quite fascinating, uh, actually, especially the guy who wondered whether or not Gary Lineker was a refugee. I certainly <laughs> wouldn't be having him in my house, that's for sure. But there we go. I'm going to go now to the panel, my esteemed panel this evening. We've got Tommy Sandu, comedian. We've got Georgia Gilholly, political commentator, and Sophie Corcoran as well, political commentator. Now, um, I just want to go to you, Sophie. Do you think that charity should start at home in this case? Have we got the room for these Afghans? Yeah, charity should always start at home. I don't really know why that's controversial, but a certain group of people have made it controversial. There is no way that we can justify veterans, people who have given everything to our country on our streets, our Gurkhas sitting outside of Downing Street starving just to get an equal pension that they so truly deserve and then say that we've now suddenly found all of this money to welcome re so many refugees into this country. We either had the facilities mm. to help our homeless veterans, to help our Gurkhas as well as these Afghans or we didn't. What was the answer? Yeah. All right, OK, we're a bit pressed for time, Georgia. I'm just going to whiz over to you now. I've had an email in from Heather. Thank you very much, Heather. Give me a list of MPs who are willing to take a refugee in. Yes, I'll wait. Do you think that more MPs should be willing to do that? Um, I think, I suppose, you know, MPs, they're public servants, so they always have a duty to, I guess, be a moral exemplar in some way, though I think we know from a lot of their track records a lot of current mm -hmm. and recent yes. ministers especially they don't always do that no i imagine i think that it depends on yeah i think it depends on the individual situation i don't think we should be saying mp's have to do this or that in this situation i think um if they feel comfortable doing so they should do so okay. if they don't for other reasons they they don't have to Tommy, your view, do you think more MPs should be leading by example here, or you're not bothered? I think everyone should lead by example. This whole thing of, uh, we shouldn't compare good causes as well. We shouldn't compare, oh, what are we doing for the veterans? What are we doing for the Africa? It, they're all worthy of our help. 
and I think this is where systems need to be in place. People need to be uh, have, have actual processes, have, have a program for these people. Uh, but everybody, everybody who can do their bit should do their bit. And when you can be charitable, when you can support those less fortunate, you should. If your house is crumbling, then you're not the right house to take in an Afghan refugee. But if you have the space and someone like, you know, m m with me and my family, we do have the space. We could. And if there was some sort of program or something that you think actually offer yourselves up, then I think we all, we all, in a privileged position, should lead by example. Fantastic stuff, all of you. Well, you'll be staying with us, of course, throughout the show, dipping in and out for us. Thank you very, very much, all of you. Now, statistics. Now, joining me is my superstar panel, political commentator Georgia L. Gil holly comedian Tommy Sandhu, and journalist and commentator Sophie Corcoran. Thank you very, very much for joining us. Yes, well, look, let's just start with, I suppose, what was on the front of the Sunday people there, really, which was the fact that now, apparently, we've got British troops sticking around, staying behind there to help look at the people that will help look after, anyway, some of the people that we've left behind. Sophie, I'll start with you. Would you like to see us do a bit more there in that respect, do you think? More, more troops, do you reckon? Um, I have a, such a great respect for those who are staying behind. They set a great example of what a nation that we actually should have done. Um, I would like to see more troops there helping the evacuation. We owe these people a lot. Um, and I think those that are staying behind truly, you know, encapture the true British spirit and the one that we should portray to the rest of the world and that we have done in the past. So we should be very proud of those people. Mm. Sorry, I'm going to throw over to you now. And this, the government ministers, a different story now. Government ministers have been told to hire UK-based workers to address the country's chronic shortage of lorry drivers as hundreds of thousands of Britons prepare to uh, leave the COVID-19 furlough scheme. And I just want to see, on Sunday, do you think actually we should be doing more to employ British? We've got, we import a lot of nurses, don't we, from other parts of the world as well? And that's great, by the way. I personally don't care who's saving my life as long as somebody is, right? <laughs> but uh, that said, maybe we could go and get a few more British people in work. What do you reckon? Yeah, well, absolutely. Look, you've got, you got to, again, like we talk about charity starting at home, we talk about everything. The, the route to a lot of problems is you start by looking around you, see what resources you have. If we've got many people unemployed and we could put them towards uh, driving lorries, but, but I, the, the problem is broader than that. The problems are the backlog of, of you know, licenses that haven't been dealt with uh, and, and the various issues around whether it be COVID or Brexit or, or just a general uh, lack of support for the lorry, lorry driving community, as it were, and the poor wages that they've got as well. So there's, there's so many factors here. The fact is, I, th I just don't think there's a lot of youngsters. If I, if I turn around to some 19 year olds that I now know, 19 and 23, are we my new 19, 23 year old friends here? <laughs> We're here on, a, on a bank holiday weekend, hanging out with young people. People. This hasn't happened to me for a long time, Patrick. No, I'm very right. excited about hanging out. I've got young, cool friends. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, if you ask them, do you want to drive a lorry? They'll say no. I go, no. Actually, you look at the wages, you look at the hours, and, and it's just not attractive enough. But we're realising how key it is to keeping this country moving. So, um, so I think they've got to make lorry driving a bit more sexy. That's what they've got to do. Sexy. Yeah, man, that's what how it is. How do you sex up lorry driving? Uh, topless lorry driving. Topless, I'm not yeah. sure. Have you seen lorry driving? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was a joke. I'm no. going to cop it. I'm going to cop it. <laughs> the lorry driving community now. <laughs> I'm going to end up getting sent loads of topless pictures from lorry drivers. <laughs> anyway, uh, the business secretary, Kwasi Kwarteng, did for, uh, write uh, on Friday that business leaders uh, should be uh, essentially doing more to promote uh, British workers, supposedly, and even calling for certain things as well, like maybe paying them a little bit more. And, Georgia, do you think that's been a problem for a while? The perception, at least, has been that we've been able to get away with maybe underpaying largely foreign workforces as opposed to maybe paying British workers what they're worth? Um, yes and no. I do think that the attitude to, I suppose, manual professions is quite a poor attitude nowadays. Um, and I think, Sammy, you're right in saying that maybe if you ask a lot of the young people who, mm. let's say they're about to leave school, if they want to be a lorry, lorry driver, most of them will say no. Um, and I do think that we have uh, used that kind of, those professions being unfashionable as an excuse to um, I suppose rely on foreign, mainly EU labour and also, um, let's emphasise the point, underpaid labour, um, which is really unfortunate for, I guess, the people who mm. are in those professions. No, absolutely. I, I think it's been, um, it's, been, it's been a massive issue for a lot of people. Clearly it has been about the idea now that essentially you could get undercut. It did make me laugh a lot, though, when sometimes, you know, that old kind of, that basically that racist trope of being like, oh, coming over here and stealing our jobs, and you look at it, it's like, well, yeah, but the neurosurgeon <laughs> from, from, from Iran <laughs> is not coming over here and stealing my job, is he? You know, I think, I think I'm not at the racist 
when it comes to that kind of uh, that kind of thing. Well, uh, we're going to move away from that story now and look at one of the other stories in our in our media buzz. Uh, the Queen's courtiers are apparently nervous over Carrie Johnson's first Balmoral trip with <laughs> Boris. Uh, you got, they've got a lot on this lot. They shouldn't be worried about this. Anyway, uh, and it's going to be at Christmas, uh, and they'd rather it didn't go ahead, they say, due to the COVID risk. I wonder if it was because actually they don't carry some re wallpaper the place. <laughs> they'd have to refund, the, they'd have to raise our taxes. Anyway, Carrie Johnson is reportedly desperate to stay with the Queen for the first time since she married Boris, but it's been said that courtiers are becoming increasingly nervous about their planned visit. So, their stay at the Scottish Royal Retreat was cancelled last summer and officials are desperate to make sure Her Majesty is not put at risk of catching Covid. Boris and Carrie will be asked to avoid meeting other people in the days leading up to the trip and take regular Covid tests. Now the Queen is 95 years old, she has apparently had both doses of the vaccine but given her age courtiers are still keen that she doesn't catch the virus. I mean, I think we all are, aren't we, really? Uh, however mild the possible symptoms. Now, courtiers' fears were highlighted by Dominic Cummings' claims that the PM had to be talked out of meeting the Queen in London a week before Britain went into lockdown for the first time. Well, look, there we go. I want to get uh, get your take on this. Sorry, I'll start, I'll start yeah. with you. I mean, look, I suppose we just shouldn't be doing anything that can endanger our Queen, should we? Well, yeah, but also, it's bank holiday weekend. Who's planning Christmas? No one's planning Christmas. You shouldn't, you shouldn't be thinking about who... I'm not thinking about who I've got coming over for Christmas yet. You ha that happens a lot later on. But that aside, uh, of course, uh, we shouldn't... But how can the Prime Minister and his missus be told to keep away from people mm. in the build-up to Christmas? Christmas is the time when the Prime Minister's out shaking everybody's hands, wishing everybody well for Christmas, and then he's going to go mix with the Queen. Uh, look, if I had a 95-year-old grandmother i'd be nervous about someone who is as publicly exposed mm. as boris johnson yeah. being around i just i don't think i don't i don't think i want boris johnson around my grandmother anyway just <laughs> for, for other reasons <laughs> but um you never know what could happen well, uh, wow <laughs> well uh, sophie i want to get here from you on this now you know realistically is this do you think some kind of carry based vanity project she just wants to meet the queen and so we've therefore got to put the queen <laughs> at risk or do you think it's the right thing to do uh, well, Carrie is well known for her vanity, of course, so I have no doubt that it's a Carrie-based vanity project. And the reality is, it's Christmas, you don't want Boris and Carrie, you have your family. There's no need to put the Queen at risk, she's not part of their family. I think Carrie just wants to, you know, take a photo and put it on her Twitter. I think they've come full circle, haven't they? Because last Christmas we were being told we weren't allowed to meet anyone. You had to, you know, have Christmas dinner with your nan and feed her out of a hatch into your back yeah. garden and, like, <laughs> winch the food in <laughs> next door. And now Boris and Carrie are like, we're turning up. Yeah. Yeah. We're there, we're coming round. George, how would you feel about this? If you, would you think that Boris Johnson should be meeting the Queen at Christmas? Personally, I think that it's up to the royal family and the Queen herself. So, if their reasoning is COVID, perhaps if their reasoning isn't COVID and they would rather not spend yes. Christmas with Carrie and Boris, mm. um, I'm completely okay with that. It really doesn't bother me. I think we've got enough to be getting on with. Well, I would have thought the royal <laughs> family have got enough to be getting on with at the moment as well, <laughs> to be honest with you. I mean, they're, they're copping it. However, I am currently copping it, actually, on uh, on Twitter a little bit for some of the comments that I made regarding Pen Farthing and Operation Ark. And I'm quite keen to, to, to ex explore this a little bit, really, saying, oh, you know, actually, look, come on, you know, there's, there, there's nothing wrong with the fact that we've, we've released all... It's not released, but that we've evacuated all these animals, something like 140 dogs, about 60 cats, something like that. I mean, the thing is that I'm not trying to pit them against each other. I'm very glad that the animals have got out of there. I'm very glad that Penn's got out of there. Of course I am. I am also just saying that at the time that that flight was taking off or is taking off, you know, there are Afghan interpreters there and people there that are standing, or presumably at that airport, desperate to come to this country. And I don't see why the two things have to be mutually exclusive. I mean, Sophie, your, your take on that? Do you think that realistically it was a case of, uh, like, it's fine that we've got really, we've got the animals out of there, or would you have rather seen more humans as well? Well, uh, I'd say I'd rather have seen more humans, but I think it's fine uh, that we've got the animals. Although I do agree with you, on, disagree with you, sorry, on one oh, thing. Oh, go on, here we go. <laughs> the whole it's not mutually exclusive no you're right if we could help everybody in the world then we could but mm. unfortunately the world doesn't work that way and you know i'd love to save every single afghan that i could i've lo loved to save every single dog that i could but it's just not possible mm. we need to make sure we have this wonderful thing that the entire world has just thrown away this last couple of years called priorities mm. what's and your what's your thoughts on it georgia um, I think that people are focusing on this because perhaps maybe in a way it does epitomise that this, um, I suppose, growing mm. thing we have of maybe 
not necessarily valuing human life over animal life, uh, which I think most humans would realistically, and I think we should always try to preserve human life when possible. However, I do think it's sort of a bit of a, I mean, ugh, not a storm in a teacup because it is it is a real issue, and who knows, maybe Afghan interpreters could have been on that mm. plane instead of animals. But I think it's one of the situations where it's not this gentleman's fault; it's the organisation of the situation, which is completely beyond his hands, and. It's the absolute, I guess, ominous shambles that's yeah. been caused by the withdrawal, and it's, it's nothing to do with him. No, no, exactly no, yeah. that. Exactly yeah. that. I mean, he's he's obviously. I mean, I don't I think I've ever come across in my life a more obvious example of a bloke who loves animals <laughs> as much as this guy, right? You know, he's he was in Kabul, you know, with with all these rescue dogs and rescue cats. Some of them horrendously abused, some of them horrendously hurt. He's obviously gone to hell and high water now to try to get them back over here or over here to begin with, and to a place of safety. I think you know, it's not, nothing to do with that whatsoever. It's just the fact that if you are are now like kind of uh, siphoning off some element of British resources so you know whether it's military staff or whatever who are helping get them on the plane or whatever could that not have been used towards you know maybe helping some other human beings get out there as well Tommy yeah and I know that can anyone else sort of see uh, you know a movie in the making here I think he likes the attention as well a uh, uh, pen and um, and it feels like he's getting geared up towards the film so he's talking about the, the book already and people there's been talk of the book and the film so um, so you wonder you wonder what the motives are behind it and you're right the resources element is, is a big concern because here we are talking about it the world's talking about him and the, the 200 animals and all of that i'm sure is putting pressure on officials kind of going oh god this story just won't go away can we sort the the, the pets out and you're right and then human life is being forgotten mm -hmm. and i'm you know let's not get into it, picking one over the other it's just more it's all a mess it all needs our attention and yet there's one story here that's kind of pushing up and pushing a certain agenda because it's getting more media coverage and I, you could argue there's, there's there's humans that have been left there potentially to die uh, mm. uh, we can't even begin to imagine what they're going through right now. No, massive intelligence failings as well, it's fair to say, frankly, from start to finish, actually. You know, initially the idea that Kabul wouldn't fall for several months. I mean, I think we were quite annoyed that it was going to fall at all, to be perfectly honest with you. But there we go, that was a failing. And then, of course, there was another failing, wasn't there? So we left the um, contact details and everything of our, our Afghan interpreters, people who'd helped us, even CVs of people who'd applied for jobs. So we've essentially now armed the Taliban and also told them exactly where the people are that they hate so not a great look for us more of the media buzz coming your way very short yes welcome back to tonight live more on the media buzz now with tonight's superstar top draw panel political commentator Georgia Elgil Holly comedian Tommy Sandu and journalist and commentator Sophie Corcoran and there's lots of us lots for us to get stuck into tonight now it's bank holiday weekend of course and that means in this country anyway one thing loads of people getting absolutely smashed boozy Britons will be in excellent spirits around the country now Revelers have reportedly hit the towns and city centres already across the nation for several drink fueled nights going forward and large crowds of pub goers hit the streets in London and Leeds to enjoy the bustling post lockdown nightlife after nearly 16 months of closed nightclubs due to the pandemic. Now glamorous Britons <coughs> they appeared to be having the time of their lives in cities as they danced, laughed and posed on the streets while well, many Britons are set to hit the road across the bank holiday weekend as well and the RAC is estimating that 16.7 million leisure trips are planned over the next three days with hopes of good late summer weather possibly seeing even more people jumping in their car for a day trip or last minute break but party goers have been warned that there could be a beer shortage due to HGV driver shortages so this is going to be interesting I wonder if that's where people will draw the line right I was fine with us not having stuff on our shelves for a while I was fine with the idea that maybe not enough British people are in work but the second I can't buy a pint well we've got to sort it out Tommy we got your views yeah exactly it's the, now things are getting serious yeah here we Let's know deal with the real hey, topics okay? you can take anything away don't take my beer yeah. uh, it's um it, it, you know what I, I love it I, I just on the drive in today uh, coming into central London everybody's out the car come from, come from the east end of London so you go through Shoreditch and Liverpool Street and there's people out in the street there's people stumbling in front of the car and stuff I, I miss this man I miss I miss life and people and noise and clubs and people copping off with other people that they shouldn't be copping off with. come on bring on bring back the good old days it's good to see everybody back good to see everybody enjoying their life as well I think people have needed this mm, well enough about Matt Hancock uh, I'm gonna go <laughs> to, to, to you Georgia do you think that, that we have an issue with uh, binge drinking in this country 
country. You know, when you go to France, you see people there, don't you? A sophisticated glass of red on the go, yeah? slowly swilling it as they listen to a bit of opera, whereas here it's 15, 15 pints deep in a Ginsters, and we call that Saturday, don't we? What's your take? Yeah, my main question when I read this story is, how come it's a news story? This is, you know, every weekend in uh, the UK. <laughs> mm. um, I think, yeah, th I think there are issues with, with drinking, binge drinking, and other substance abuse issues, as there are in every country around the world, really. Um, but, you know, it's good to see people enjoying themselves, I suppose, especially after um, the year that we've had. Yeah, Sophie, it's just nice to see people out and about again, isn't it, really? Oh, yes. Um, I went to the theatre on Thursday, and it was so good seeing crowds and full theatres, no social distancing, no gaps, Soho full of people drinking. That's who we are as a country, that's who we are as a city. I'm so glad that we've got our um, enjoyment back and the life back that we've had and I just fingers crossed that it stays and that we should never ever take it for granted again. Well, no, we certainly shouldn't. I must say, I did start to question it a little bit when the Euros were on. It was an absolute vibe, wasn't it? I was certainly, I was in London at the time as well. And it was just a really feel good situation. But then we lost on penalties. And I went outside to the corner shop down the road and I was on quite a busy high street in London. And all of that kind of love and national joy and everything, people were just fighting each other in the street. There was about six police vans there. The corner shop I was going to get some juice from was being was being looted, pretty much as it were then. And I was thinking, this really is... We do, we do sink quite fast. Do you think that maybe there should be more uh, done in this country, Tommy, to, do with, to deal with um, alcohol addiction, to deal with, you know, awareness? Because especially during lockdown as well, we had a situation, didn't we, where there were massive, massive, massive surges in alcohol-related deaths. Um, yeah, you're right. Um, alcohol addiction is real. The problems are real. The way it infiltrates into families and the damage it can cause is real. Um, I gave up alcohol oh. at the start of lockdown. So I'm now, I, I'm saying it like, a, like I was an alcoholic, but it's, eight, it's been 18 months for me without a drop wow. of booze. And I love booze. I still, I want to I say now, for the record, you know, the thought of when you just mentioned the red wine, I was like, oh, mm. yeah, that's nice, isn't it? In France, a little bit of bread and cheese and some wine. I love all that. I love cocktails. I love shots. I love Jaegers. I, I'm literally, I have good memories. So there's nothing against booze and drinking. And I love what it does. It turns a, a regular night into a bit mm. of a party. But I gave it up because there's problems with alcohol in my family. I've got two sons. Those problems are going to carry on if I carry on drinking. With, you know, and the culture that we have, even as a Punjabi Indian guy who's from born and raised in Great Britain, I've got, I've got almost a combination of British drinking culture mm. and Punjabi drinking culture. It's dangerous. Is there um, a big drinking culture over there, yeah? Huge, huge. And, um, you know, yeah. whiskey bottles and big... And, and, every, and doing things to excess as well um, it is very typical of... Punjabi drinking culture and, and Indian Indian drinking culture. So, um, so I wanted to break that cycle. So that's why I you know I personally gave up. And actually, I noticed all the stories coming through, all the people that were saying actually we're drinking more in lockdown. And I'm like, oh, I'm so glad I just by coincidence went the other way on it. But it, it's it's a slippery slope. And anyone who's been on a few drinking binges or maybe been on a stag do, then it's the wedding, and then it's you're like, wow, or Christmas time. You're like, mm. all of a sudden. I've drunk every day for like 20, 30, 40 days. It adds days. up, doesn't it? Done. It does add up and it can easily get away from you, I think. But look, we'll, we'll, we'll move on from uh, British drinking culture now and talk about things that make your blood boil. So from people blocking shop entrances to others shouting down their phones in public, I do that all the time, by the way, so I'm guilty of that. Social media users from around the world have shared some of their fury-inducing experiences. So one user wrote, People who enter the bus slash train or whatever without letting others out first. Yeah, I get that, especially on the London Underground, you do actually find that a lot where, you know, you've got to let people off, but no, alas, I'm now fighting you for the only remaining seat. Uh, another shared their frustration with their significant other's habit of soaking the dishes before watching them, something which uh, which almost seems to, to never happen. Uh, so what's your pet peeve? And so I understand that uh, maybe you're going to be able to tell me some of your, your pet peeves. I've got a couple, so I don't don't like it when people say espresso not espresso that's um, it i've got to chip in that i'm with you on that 100 yeah. percent that's not a word that's one of mine that's not how you spell it that's not, not how that. it's written it's, it's not, not how it's supposed to be said because it's small they think it's express and i'm going to get it in an express yeah and I'm like, it's not espresso it's an but then you know what we're the idiots for getting bogged down with that don't you feel that don't you don't yeah, you, you hate yourself a little bit patrick because you're like why is that bugging me it's, it's bugging me and i don't know why it's just a really pet peeve people who say theater 
So I'm very glad, Sophie, that you didn't say theatre. You said theatre, and I think that's how it's supposed to be said. I don't know. Right, Georgia, what's your pet peeve? Have you got one? Gosh, OK. Um, probably have many. Um, I think um, this is more sort of, I guess, my problem because I'm a little bit obsessed sometimes with geography. I find people's ignorance when it comes to that quite astounding. And actually, one of the things I've noticed this week, the least of our problems, obviously, on this issue, but when people refer to Afghanistan as part of the Middle East, it's not. Afghanistan is a country that is located in Central and South Asia. It's not in the Middle East. And I think Western people um, often forget mm. that. And also with Islamic countries, a lot of Western people just seem to think, oh, Muslim countries are all in the Middle East. Simply not the case. The largest um, Muslim population um, is actually in Indonesia. Yeah. Yeah. We well, see, actually, I did know that, to be fair. So it's, something, like, it's something ridiculous, like 98%. Of, of people in that country, I believe. It's something like that anyway, isn't it? It's, it's, it's mega. Uh, Sophie, what's your pet peeve? Um, I don't think anything annoys me more in this world other than Extinction Rebellion than <laughs> when people put, eat chocolate bars and they have the wrapper and they leave it in the fridge because I go to the fridge thinking, fabulous, I'm have a chocolate bar and there ain't none in there. And there's nothing more heartbreaking than that. It really winds me up. Just put it in the bin so I don't go and think I got chocolate bar when I ain't. I'm going to throw one out here now. Cyclists who cycle two or three abreast. I absolutely hate it, right? You're driving down a country road and there's, you know, oh, all of a sudden now, why have I hit traffic for no reason whatsoever? And it's because Dave and his mate Keith think they're in the Tour de France and they've packed themselves into some lycra and now they're ruining my day. Tommy, does that bother you? Uh, uh, well, Are I'm, you one of them? You no. look like a man who might cycle, actually. No, no, I do cycle. I enjoy it because I live near the forest and it's a uh, Epping Forest, so it's, uh, it's nice to cycle around there. But, um, no, we're single file. And, and some of you know, you've got to shout like that to the guy behind you because, you know, the, you've got to make the sound yeah. travel. So, no, we don't go side by side. Side by side is what the girls used to do in the school corridors at school. All of them, five of them, and they used to link arms as well. That was like a little, it was like a constant free kickball to so get round. Uh, no, my, my pet peeve is, is it's, it's all the silly little things of life, right? Mm. It's separate hot cold taps. Why do you need you separate? I can't, uh, I can't get the mix. You have two of the same. You have must have two of the same. Because then you can get warm. But otherwise, you're, you're scolding, you're freezing. Scolding, freezing, freezing, scolding. I, it doesn't work for me. So mix and taps. Why, why do we do separates? I think that's, that's interesting. So what would you, what, why, if you just want ruthless tap efficiency, essentially? Yeah, I'm saying I don't, I don't like, because when you have <laughs> ruthless tap efficiency, that's what I'm seeking. That's what yeah, I'm thinking. I want ruthless my course. Yes. <laughs> yeah. No, but I just, I, meaning, like, you don't ever want scalding hot or freezing cold. Look, these are the silly little problems. I've got to say, I don't spend a lot of my day thinking about this issue, but it is one of the things. When I see a separate one, I'm like, right, well, I can only go hot for a bit because then it's going to get too hot and I've got to switch to the cold. Then my hands are going to go through that. You know, it's, these are real problems, Patrick. So we've got real time problem. for one more, Georgia. I'm putting you on the spot here. Apart from presenters who put you on the spot, have you got any other pet peeves? You've mentioned geography being one of them, or lack of bad geography. Any others that spring to mind for you? Um, probably, yeah, the thing about on the tube when you're waiting to get on, oh, especially yeah. if it's super busy, and there are certain people who will stand in front of the doors when they know that people are about to try and get off. I think that's just... And that Patrick, is really impolite. Patrick, I need to do one more. Go it's on. when people point at your food and go, oh, what's that? Yeah, Don't or when they just have a bit of it. Yeah, no, well, that's, another, that's oh, a whole other thing. Yeah, you're right. But just, just a look at it and go, eh, what's that? Are you going to eat that? Eh, what is it? And I'm like, don't make that face. I'm about to eat it, and I was enjoying it until I saw your face. So uh, I'd rather you do it. I like. I don't like it when you know you go out for dinner with someone or whatever, and they're like, "What are you going to have?" You know, you've all been presented with exactly the same menu. We know how a restaurant works. You know, your waiter or waitress comes over, you tell them what it is you personally want to eat, and then they then deliver that to you, and you personally should have the right to eat it. And then actually, what happens all too often is someone goes, "Oh, I wish I'd ordered that." Can I just have a bit? No, you can't. You've made it bad. Lie in it. That's my view on it. You're not anyway. a sharer, Patrick. You're not a sharer? <laughs> What's that, sorry? You're not a sharer? Sharing is kind uh, of... Do yeah. I, you don't get a body like this by sharing, <laughs> all right? It doesn't happen, OK? okay. It doesn't happen, I'm afraid. Fair. Patrick does not share food. Thank you very, very much. You will, of course, be coming in and out of the studio throughout as well. That is my esteemed Media Buzz panel. So thank you very much for all of that. We're going to be back with you very, very shortly. Uh, here you go, Bex. Thank you very much. Bex Shiner there. Uncancelled. There you are. So let's see what my panel have to say on this. I've got political commentator Georgia Gilholly, comedian T Tommy Sandy, and of course, journalist and commentator Sophie Corcoran. Now, 
I'd quite like to ask. Uh, uh, we're keeping backs on as well. Fantastic stuff. Move Look, I, I mean, it, there's a, there's a certain certain relevance here. Obviously, you have two relatively young young women joining us on, on the panel, and I've just wondered, you know, Sophie, what's your take on on people who do this kind of work? I mean, certainly, I don't know if you've got friends who, who who do it as well. I don't know what 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 your what your thoughts on it are really. Um, no, I don't. And to be as polite as I possibly can. I do not believe that we should be encouraging young girls to grow up to go into sex work. No. I why, think why not, then? Why not? I think that young we girls should, in this country should. should grow up to be prime ministers, to be scientists, to be doctors, not sex workers. I don't think girls should be encouraged to sell their bodies. There is nothing dignifying about that. And listen, the progressives mm. are going to come out here and say that this is empowering mm. and, you know, claiming that all of this and allowing sex work is progressive. Let me say, there is nothing progressive about encouraging women to sell their bodies. That was something that would have been done years and years ago. Women right. are well, so well, much better than that. All right, well, look, let's, 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 let's have your side of it then, Bax. You know, I, I want to say, firstly, I can't go and be a politician. I don't want to be a politician. I can't, I've got the brains and the, and the drive to go and be one of those, you know, big jobs that you're saying. And I don't sell my body. No one gets to touch me. People can look at a picture of me. Um, but yeah, no one gets to touch me, no one gets to come near me. I don't feel like I'm selling my body. I feel like I'm selling a photo of my body and then I'm putting my phone down and carry on with my life and cooking my dinner for my child, like. Well, yeah, and, and, uh, and I don't need to know exactly what your personal circumstances are, of course not, but I don't know if, you've, if you said you've got a daughter or, or, or would you, if you, if, you do, if you do have a daughter, which I think you do, uh, would you be happy for her to go into this line of work? Of course not. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't encourage that at all. You know, like like the other uh, lady down there said, I would love to encourage her to be able to go and be a politician or a doctor. But luckily, I can afford to send her to private school, so hopefully that will happen. Well, there you go. That's an interesting point, Tommy. Your thoughts on that? I, th I think. Look at what, what's up, Bex? How you doing? You all right? Mm -hmm. Okay. First, I've got to say, look, listen to Bex's voice. Did you know each other? <laughs> yeah? listen, no, but I want to. <laughs> Hello. Right. Listen to Bex's voice. Listen to how happy she is. Yeah. Since this is someone who's doing her, she's doing her thing. She's earning her money, and you can hear what you said. Look at the comfort that comes with being able to pay your bills, drive the car, look after your kids. That's ultimately what we all want. We want that security. She's found her path through the Big Brother, through various things. Here it is. You've got the safe distance. You can do a thing. This business is going to go on regardless. It's gone on for thousands of years. Well, it's and never going to end. to go on. Yeah. It's just in a new media and a new format. I mm -hmm. say each to their own. Who are we to judge? Let Bex be Bex. Bex, if you're providing, you're doing your thing. God bless you. All the, all the best. And you know, can I just say one thing as well? You only get one life, right? You get one chance at this. And I'm having an absolutely amazing time. Like, you know. OK, this... Georgie, your, your views, just to bring you, bring you in on this issue as well. Um, really, my main point is that I think it's deeply irresponsible to be presenting this as a glamorous millionaire lifestyle um, sex work. The average owner creator expensive. makes $180 a month on average. On average, on average yeah, you don't be working. And most of the people who are in sex work, right, right, okay, most well, of the people who are in sex me. work are not on OnlyFans, which is obviously a lot safer for them. Hmm. They're on the streets. They're being exploited. Many of them have suffered sexual assault, and many of them are forced into the industry out of economic insecurity or a history of abuse. It's not the choice that we present it as. Unfortunately, it's not. Um, I'm very glad. About. I'm very glad that you're happy with your choice, but I don't think it's representative of the sex industry as a whole. Well, George's got obviously got some very strong views mm -hmm. on it. On it, there. Your your response there, Bex. I just don't think that's what we're talking about, though, is that, I mean, if you're talking about, um, uh, you know, people being exploited and uh, people being sex trafficked, that's a completely different issue to what I'm doing. You know, I'm doing this out of choice. Um, that is an issue and that is something that we completely need to address. And that is why OnlyFans are cracking down. That is why all websites are cracking down and you have to be verified. And that's what we're trying to stop. I can play, I want that to stop. Of course, that's what, I'm, that's what I'm here for. I don't want anyone to be exploited. I want this to be a choice and a lifestyle. Mm. I think uh, one of the one of the points George was making there, not to put words in their mouth or anything, what, yeah. but was the the idea of the fact that some women are forced into it due to economic insecurity, and and that's really I think where that argument of well, is it an empowering thing? Is it the woman making her own choice necessarily to go and do it, or actually are there other areas of life and society that actually disproportionately force women into that, that line of work? Well, what do you think about that? I actually think there's a lot of industries where women are forced into doing things they don't want to do, as well as the um, 
famous industry, like the reality TV world, I know a lot of girls are made to do things they don't want to do to get jobs. And it is not just the sex industry. Um, and I think that you have, I think that's why you've got me on here, because I'm completely comfortable in doing it. And there are obviously issues in every single aspect of, of work where women are being exploited and made to do jobs they don't want to do. Um, but yeah, I think, there is different. Yeah, yeah. I think that's no. I think that's a really, really. I think that's a really interesting point, and it's obviously something me as a may shock you as, as someone who isn't a woman. Uh, I, I maybe would struggle <laughs> to fully. Maybe would struggle to fully understand. Uh, but Sophie, go on. I want to, to hear a bit more from, from from you on this. Really, obviously, it was not certainly doesn't sound like a line of work that you would ever uh, particularly think of going down at all. Can you understand though why some people do? Yeah, I can understand why they do, and I'm very happy for you that you are living the life of your you know desire. But isn't that the problem? That's the problem. Just look at this conversation we're having. Look how far society has fallen. The fact that somebody selling naked pictures of themselves can have a better life than our doctors. That is exactly the problem we're having in society. The exact reason we have no ambition among young people. Young people don't want to go into these lorry driver jobs because they, what they can do is they can go on Love Island or they can post naked photos of themselves online and make a killing. This whole idea of glamorization of reality shows um, only fans, sex work has led to a lot of young people, you know, influencer lifestyle, a lot of young people abandoning the will to work real jobs because they can make a killing in these effectively well, worthless jobs. Well, worthless. Bex, well, Bex, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, there's, there's an interesting question. Pot there's a potential question here in the sense of, like, if, if, if you just had another job offer that was worth more money, would you do that instead? Or do you actually just genuinely really love what you do now? I have an easy life. I get to work a couple of hours a day and um, spend the rest of my time with my children. So if for me, no, I, I wouldn't. But I completely agree with what you're saying. A hundred percent. I mean, I've had it easy since Big Brother. I managed to, I, you know, I could, I could just, I could do what I want. But um, like, I don't know. I, 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 I'm sort of agreeing with what you're saying. I am a hundred percent because I don't want my ch my child to go into this industry. No, of course I don't. I don't want to see her do that but i'd love her to go and be a doctor or a nurse or something else but I, I don't know before, I, well you rightly said before you're you're as a result of of you you know earning the amount that you're earning from this you may be in a position to to try to ensure that that situation could happen and i, I think to, tommy I don't if think anything, you should be angry but, about it no no but I'm i very think angry. i don't think you should be that angry over it i mean you know there are i'm not you know there is other jobs there is women who, who are doctors and there is women who are prime ministers and who are, yeah. you know what i mean i'm a, I'm a little fish in a big tree yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not, to be fair, it's not your responsibility to, 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 to look after all womankind. But, Tommy, no. I, I mean, if, if anything, if there's an argument, and people, no doubt, other people in this panel may well disagree with this, but there's an argument that it's responsible parenting, isn't it? She's giving her daughter a cracking education. Y yes, she is. And, and also, I was going to say, I thought you were going to say there's an argument that actually having things like OnlyFans, which creates a safe distance between mm. someone like Bex and their customers, um, it actually allows there to be a channel for people to have their desires satisfied in any way, shape or form, uh, but without the risk to people like Bex and other people. So, and also when we talk about sex industry workers, or sex, that's, a, that's a, a real, there's a real scale, there. there's a real spectrum of how that work is done and where it's carried out and how it's carried out. Um, I think what Bex is doing is, is, is borderline harmless sort of fun and if people sign up to it and if Bex is okay with it and the, the people, the punters that are going there are right with it and it's all on online, mm. then, then long may her success continue. But obviously there are other elements of this industry that need a lot more monitoring. And of course, Bex is doing this yeah. as a sacrifice. I, when, as I hear you talking, it's kind of no dissimilar to my parents saying, oh, you know, we work this many jobs or this many hours or all that. Mm. Bex is doing that so her kids don't have to. And she's created that change already, a change that wouldn't have happened mm. had it not been for only well, we're, we're, we're pressed for time, but I'll just let you have the final word back, so I think that's the least we can do. Yeah, I just want to say as well, you know, I, don't, I know that the girls keep going on about feeling empowered. I'm not, I'm not doing this to feel empowered. I don't feel empowered. I, I'm not doing this for women's rights. I feel, you know, I want to jump around and burn my bra. You know, I literally am just doing this because I want to. I'm not being forced into anything, and it's not. Okay. You know.
All right, well, look, can I just say thank, thank you very much? me. No, thank you, honestly. And I think, it, honestly, genuinely, I found the whole discussion enlightening on, on, on both counts as well. And it brings me absolute pleasure to say to you, you are now officially uncancelled. There you are. Back at it. Beck Shiner, thank I'm you. Back. Job back. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very, very much. And, uh, well, look, it's time for me to go back to my esteemed panel now and have a chat through all of these topics that we've just been speaking about there. Look, I think one of the main ones there, we'll start with the, we'll start with the heavier stuff and work our way on to people razzing lawnmowers across the countryside. Um, look, uh, we have got a bit of a problem, I think, where maybe common sense, and some would say, anyway, common sense, maybe having a heart, having a, a, some decency about you, is now, it's gone out the window in face of our kind of COVID isolation rules. George, what's the, what do you think on this? Does it have to actually just be the same rules for everyone? Could we not maybe exempt this individual so he can come back and see his dying father? No, absolutely. I think this situation in particular is very appalling. Um, especially if he can, you know, he can take a test and see if he has COVID mm. and find out, you know, whether he's negative or positive. And he should be able to visit his uh, father um, in these circumstances. And, you know, in general, if, if his case does not mm. qualify as an extreme compassionate case, well, then what does? Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. mean, come on. No, I'm inclined to agree, Sophie. Well, look, we had the Euros, obviously it was a great part of our nation, but mm. we had people come in on from red list countries who were exempt from the quarantine. So you cannot tell me that somebody whose father is dying shouldn't come and see his dying father. I mean, that is disgusting. Where have we gone wrong as a country? What, what, have we lost our minds? Have you lost your minds, people? What are you doing? This is somebody's dying father, but we have football taking the priorities. This, this country's a mess. We need to get our priorities straight. I mean, That's sure, what I'm saying. surely, somebody, if his father's dying anyway, I mean, what's, you know, well, obviously we don't want him to get COVID as well, but I mean, does it make that much of a difference? It's the bit, exactly that. It's exactly what I was thinking. It's the bit that doesn't make any sense. Who is that danger here? If, mm. he, if he's got it, then the, 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 the son who's traveling over, then he's got it. If he passes it on, I'm sorry to say, we, under the circumstances, it, it really it really doesn't matter. It's days to live anyway. But it's rules. We're following kind of box tick kind of rules. Well, it's a system. It's, it comes back to that kind of computer says, no, yeah, we're punching your details. Turns out you don't qualify. Like, but come on, sh someone's got to override that and go, guys, even if he just comes off the plane, goes straight to see his dad and sees nobody else, mm. and then quarantines after that. Yeah, there's a way around everything, and I, it's, it's sad. That guy, the, 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 unfortunately, the soldier's going to live for the rest of his life knowing that he didn't get to see his dad in his final days. Yeah, yeah. I think it's absolutely horrendous, really. And it is just that thing of, as a nation, have we not got him a bit more of a heart? And I can't help but wonder that I do understand that it must take a lot of front to make the kind of decisions that the people in the higher-ups do, right? I don't, wouldn't want to be responsible for you know, the idea that decisions I make could lead to people dying or being miserable. Someone's got to make that decision, and I understand that. But in this situation, I'm looking at it, I'm like, how can you not have a bit more common sense? How can you not have a bit more compassion? But lighter stuff now, the MOA Racing yes. Association. I mean, this is incredible. I, 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 Georgia, you strike me as the type of person who would who would love to get on a a, a, a kind of a nitroed up lawnmower and razz it across Sark Island. You were saying, by the way, before about geography. Do you know where Sark Island is? It's in the Channel Islands. Hey, <laughs> straight off the bat, <laughs> very on brand. I tell you what, I bet you'd be great at a pub quiz, wouldn't you? I'm okay. I'm okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> brilliant. Well, I know. Yeah. I think. I think. I think we need to find a pub and go and, <laughs> and win the prize. But anyway, go on. Would you be getting involved in this? Um, um, it looks very exciting, but I don't have a driver's license, so I don't know if I'd need one to drive a lawnmower. Would I need one? Okay, well, hopefully no one's going to... It looks like anything yeah. goes. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not sure I could be trusted, to be honest, but it looks like good fun, I guess. Yeah, Tommy? I just love the fact that we're going we're to talk about this after all the conversations we've had tonight. We're going to oh, about no. lawnmower <laughs> race. This is real issues going down. Hey, look, uh, what, what a load of fun. Uh, so, so the island Sark Island, in between G uh, Guernsey and Jersey, mm -hmm. and can, they have no cars, but this is allowed. What you're saying, this is, this is, this is, this is, this is basically it's joyriders. It's a joyriders yeah. island. So send, and what we should actually do is just send all these kind of crazy 16, 17 year olds who want to, you know, before they take any driving, they go, right, go to Sark Island, go get that out of your system. Yeah. And then come here and drive properly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like great. A it's like a, yeah, yeah, like so, a driving gap here. Sophie, would you be clinging onto the back of a, 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 a souped up lawnmower? Uh, to be honest, Patrick, um, I can't even drive my trolley in Tesco without <laughs> wiping out after dairy aisle. So if I'm going to be honest, probably <laughs> not. Um, no. I'll give it a good go, though, to be fair. But I'd probably end up in hospital. I'll tell, tell you what you said about, George, about the fact that you haven't got a, a licence and stuff. I was um, I was in the dizzying heights of Bournemouth last weekend. And because, you know, you can't go anywhere. And um, it was lovely, though. 
And I went, so I decided to do one of these e-scooter things. So you can do that, you can tap in and tap out on an e-scooter, genuinely, right? So Bournemouth, apparently, we did a story on it last week, the, the local council there, supposedly anyway, have removed deck chairs from the beach because someone might pick one up and clock someone around the back of the head with it. But you can tap in and tap out of a, 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 an e-scooter that goes about 15 miles an hour. Anyway, so you can you, you don't need any real proof of it being your driver's license as well. So get it. So well, I was with a friend there, and they used my driver's license, you know, to do it. You tap it in, you do it. So actually, anyone can go and razz it around like actual streets in Bournemouth. It's crazy, isn't it, Tommy? Yeah, you're right. It, it's, again, it's the consistency of rules, and we're seeing that across the board in life in so many ways. We're like, well, how can, you say about the Euros, how can that happen? How can we're allowed this? And wh who's not policing that? And those e-scooters are dangerous, you know? And you see, yeah. a, you see a lot of young kids. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you're like, where on one wheel? <laughs> oh, that was you, was it? The, the famous... Uh... That was me. I'm not yeah. admitting it. There's a court case yet to happen. <laughs> right. And I will be, uh, I'll be denying, denying, that, denying. Down on Bournemouth Pier. Yeah. But, but you're Right, yeah, uh, so someone needs to put in some because yeah, uh, all that's going to happen is someone's going to get hurt seriously, and then we're going to go, should have done something sooner. Well, actually, they are already getting hurt, aren't mm. they? I think they're banning them around London parks. I think I saw that story earlier this week because my understanding is there's been about six people who have passed away with it. So, wow. shocking stuff. Right, after the break, what was this? Is great, by the way. What was 12 <laughs> year old Jacob Rees Mogg like? Well, we'll find out. Plus, we'll reveal today's greatest Britain and Union Jackass. There's been some discrepancy about how we say that word. Jackass, jackass, where are you on the particular side of that fence? But first, time for the weather. Skies will tend to clear this evening across England and Wales, but at the same time, cloud will build across northeast Scotland and Northern Ireland, perhaps bringing the odd spot of drizzle at times as well. Later in the night, eastern areas of England and Scotland will turn cloudier, with some mist and fog patches forming elsewhere. It will remain breezy towards the southeast of the UK, but light winds elsewhere. It will again turn chilly in rural areas where skies remain clear, with lows of 5 or 6 degrees in a few spots. An early mist and fog will quickly clear, leaving a largely bright start in the west. Further east, it will be rather cloudy, with some light rain across northeast Scotland and the cloud will break up a little throughout the day to allow some spells of the sunshine by the afternoon. But the best of the sun will be reserved across Wales and southwest England. In the sunshine across the west, temperatures will reach a tropical 23 degrees Celsius, but remaining chilly along the east coast as well, especially in the brisk breeze of the North Sea.
Yes, good evening, everybody. I'm back with my panel to sample some of the stories that will be making the headlines tomorrow. And in a few minutes, my favourite part of the show, when we each choose our greatest Britain and Union jackass. Some people are saying jackass. I'm sticking with jackass. Never thought I'd be able to say that word live on television, but hey-ho, here we are. Now, my panel are with me for the rest of the show. Political commentator Georgia Gilholly, comedian Tommy Sandu, and journalist and commentator Sophie Corcoran. Thank you very much all of you for giving us all of your time this evening. Now, the Mail, the Daily Mail's front page has just dropped, I understand, so uh, it's coming with the headline, Charles for Sale for All Us. So the Prince's charity, apparently, has dumped fixers and, la and launched a probe after the Mail on Sunday unearthed extraordinary details of a scheme to sell a dinner with him for £100,000. Also on the front page is the news that William and Kate are eyeing up a surprise move to Windsor. So there we are, to uh, a very royal heavy front of the Daily Mail. I'm just going to whiz you through a bit more detail on that story before we have a chat with the panel about it. So in a newly unearthed French interview from 1982, oh no, sorry, apologies about that actually, we'll go into that in a little bit. I want to save that one actually for a bit later on. Uh, but like, just quickly guys, well I've, got, well I've obviously got you here for the rest of the show now, but for me, I don't understand what necessarily there's too much of an issue with there in terms of Charles potentially, you know, essentially being for hire, right? I mean, it really, realistically, people do this all the time. I mean, you go to an auction sometimes and you can bid. I think we do it anyway with Boris Johnson, don't we? You can you could play tennis with David Cameron back in the day, don't we? I've, I've hosted these. I've hosted a, yeah. a, a lot of these. These are corporate functions. These are charity functions. And actually, it's a good way of making money. To, a dinner with Prince Charles. There'll be a lot of people that will pay good money for that. People pay the yeah. price, if money goes to charity, Charles has a little speech, everyone, you know, everyone's very nice. It's, he doesn't it's have to do what you ask him, as well as the thing. It's not that kind of interaction. You, know? you can just sit there... It's not only fans. Oh, no, it's You're not only <laughs> fans. No. Although I imagine you'd make quite a lot of money on that, a certain clientele. No, Sophie, are you particularly bothered now that essentially it looks as though you could rent Prince Charles? No, it'd actually be quite cool, to be honest. I think, would you pay for it? He'd make a proper killing. That's good charity. <laughs> That's good charity, isn't it? I don't know anyone that won't want to go and uh, have a quick nosy up with Prince Charles. No. What do you think, Georgia? You're I less than impressed. Yeah. <laughs> You're, is, I is, think is, that's is, just my facial expression in general. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I think that I suppose, you know, you could say, okay, it seems a little bit crass mm. for a member of the royal family to be doing this, but at the end of the day, if it goes to a good charity, mm. I think it's a good thing. You know, what else are the aristocracy for? Well, that, ooh, there you go. Okay. All right. Well, we are going to move away now because talking of the aristocracy, you, you're going to love this. <laughs> right. So this is a newly unearthed French interview from 1982, and it's a 12-year-old Jacob Rees-Mogg sitting in a Rolls Royce and insisting that he will make millions, become Prime Minister by the time he's 70 and remain a bachelor because he doesn't want to get married, get divorced and she takes half of it. Donning a tweed jacket, obviously, and perched in a Rolls Royce, Mr Rees Mogg, now 52, so he's edging towards Prime Ministerial age, isn't he? <laughs> revealed his ambitious goals during this interview with a French television channel back in 1982. Take a look at this. Hello, Breach speaking. Uh, hello. Um... I wanted to ask you um, what you thought about GEC in comparison with other electrical shares. Why? Because you need money, um, and with money you can make more money, and if you've got money you can buy things, buy things that you want. I could buy this Rolls Royce, something like that, lovely. When I'm 30 I'd like to be the managing director of GEC and um, hopefully by the time I'm 70, when I'm 70, um, I'd love to become Prime Minister. Do you intend to get married and to have children? Um, no, I intend to stay a bachelor um, because I don't want to get divorced and have the wife take all my money um, and that seems to be happening so often nowadays. He's not wrong. <laughs> awesome stuff from a young Jacob oh. Rees-Mogg there. Um, right, well, where to start? Let's start with the fact that he is now married and I believe has seven kids, so he's not clearly, well, clearly he's changed his mind there, didn't see. I wonder whether or not he got a little bit older and realised there were certain benefits to having a wife as well. Uh, but anyway, Sophie, do you, I mean, what do you make of that? Where to start? Do you think he, it shows him as being, I don't know, too privileged, too elite, or do you quite like it? I think it's fabulous. I think everyone should want to go out and become Prime Minister. I mean, I have a cardboard cut out of Margaret Thatcher, so, like, 
I'm aware of this, yeah. and so is Twitter now yeah. as well, apparently. Can I ask how you got that? You, I mean, uh, well, what happened? What's the story? You know, lockdown, some people turn to drink, I turn to cardboard cuts out of my reflection. We all do our things to get through, I suppose. Well, hey, absolutely. i tell you what, though, I think if I was in my bedroom and I woke up, you know, sometimes you're a bit bleary-eyed or whatever, and you <laughs> wake up and the first thing I saw was Margaret Thatcher's face looming over me, I think I'd be inclined to scream, actually. But anyway, Tommy, your thoughts on a very posh, wealthy Jacob Reese mogg Well, he's 12 years old. He knows what he wants. He's got direction in life. He also knows the yeah. pitfalls of life. Hey, these women, they come along, man. They take your money, man. So who's been feeding him the lessons of life? We know who might have been yeah, feeding right. him that. <laughs> <laughs> what's interesting, at 12 years old, would this kid have got the vaccine? Would, it, would he, would, I think it, oh. if this kid knows if he will, he'll take the vaccine or not. I, I, I think, what would he have said? What would he have said, Patrick? What you oh, think? well, I couldn't possibly put words in Jacob Reese's mouth. He'd have probably invested in the vaccine and made a lot of right, money. There you go. It, I reckon. <laughs> yeah. George, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think it shows Morgan in an interesting light? Um, yeah, certainly. I think one of the interesting things is that you can tell, as Tommy said, from the way he's speaking, he's obviously very well-educated, yeah. he has purpose and direction in life. And I think that when you think about someone who's educated somewhere like Eton, like Jacob Rees-Mogg was, they're trained to be leaders mm. and probably, well, the connections aside, that's why so many of them do end up in those leadership roles and in yeah. those roles. And I think that we need to be, I suppose, improving those sort of educational standards across the board. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. It, so Jacob Rees-Mogg has, I was going to say hit back, he's not really, <laughs> he's not that bothered, but in response to the footage, the Conservative MP told The Times that he remembered the interview and he feared that six children later, it has blown his chances of being a credible 21st century <laughs> Nostradamus. Uh, in the five minute clip, Mr Rees-Mogg boasts about having set up those accounts at Barclays that you've just seen there, Lloyds, National Westminster Midland, the post office and even Harrods. And he also obviously showed him buying shares over the phone as well, which I just thought was, was fascinating to watch, actually. Can you imagine the bloke on the other end of the phone as well? Just be like, is this real? Is this happening? But I think there's a, there's, look, there's a perception, isn't there, potentially, when it comes to Jacob Rees-Mogg, that, well, it's not potentially, it's true. He had a fabulously privileged life. He had a fabulously privileged upbringing. He clearly, you know, has had all of the necessary pathways to becoming where he, where he is today. He's had every single advantage in life given to him. I'm not having a go at him for that. There's nothing to have a go at him for. He's a child, right? But I would be quite keen to know if whether or not you think that a lot of people watching this video, so if you might go, well, hang on a minute, he's not the kind of guy that I, I, I really want in power. He's, he's, the, he's the kind of quintessential Tory tough, isn't it? To be fair, Patrick, we spoke on a similar topic about this a while ago and I said the same thing. Why on earth are you not going to want the people that have been educated in the best institutions to run this country? I mean, uh, no disrespect, mm. but I do not want Bob from down the road running this country. I would rather have someone from Eton. Well, I make the point as well, actually, Tom, I don't know how you feel about yeah. this, about where if you made me Chancellor of the Exchequer, we'd have a massive party for a week and then we'd be dead, <laughs> right? Whereas Jacob Rees-Mogg or, you know, Rishi Sunak, they know how to make money. I kind of want them in charge of our country's books. I don't know. Well, OK, I I'll say this. Bob from down the road from where I live, he's making good money and he knows how to manage his money and Bob's got <laughs> a wheel of deal and he'll do some things to, to get around. To dive exactly. I think, I and also, Bob's got a better grip of life. He knows real people. He knows me and my family and my mum and the, the kind of minorities that we maybe come from as well as the privileged lot. So Bob, I think, could be whoever this Bob is. This Bob's could, your only fan. <laughs> exactly. Bob's, exactly. Bob's on his own. Bob's on his own only fan. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think Bob could do a, a very good job at running the country, and we don't we don't necessarily need the the, the Jacob Reese Moggs of the world to run it. I think Bob could do a good job. You mentioned there uh, about maybe kind of increasing attainment or, or maybe raising the bar in education generally around this country. Uh, I'll just maybe expand a bit on how how you think we can actually do that, really. Gosh, I mean, I think um, improving academic standards, um, introducing um, proper rigor when it comes to the curriculum. We almost teach children in certain. In certain subjects, we teach them sort of things at random and they're not connected properly. We don't really teach them proper grammar, that kind of thing nowadays. And you'll have a situation where you'll sort of look at that happening in state schools and people say, OK, well, you know, they don't need to learn this or whatever. Mm. But then obviously, if you go somewhere like Eton, you know, mm. the, the parents are paying these, these fees and they are learning those things, which means that we create this imbalance. And I think that people look at someone like Jacob Rees-Mogg, who was educated at Eton mm. and other people similar to him, um, and they sort of want to rag on those institutions. 
that's not the solution. The solution is raising the standards mm. everywhere rather than trying to, say, abolish private schools or abolish... Yeah. And I think, as know, well, look, yeah. I know a lot of people that had all of that privilege and went on to do absolutely nothing with it, <laughs> yeah. right, actually. <laughs> and at least, at least Jacob Rees-Mogg is he's having a quite a good crack at life, isn't he? But uh, there we are. Now, just, I think, in, in direct relation to this, does money actually make you happy? Well, according to one psychologist, it doesn't. Hmm, intrig intriguing this. Dr Sue Rofi has dispelled the common myths about what it takes to live a happy life and insists rather that close relationships, a positive attitude and a sense of purpose is key. Yeah, I think I'd also like to be a multimillionaire though. In her book, Creating the World We Want to Live In, she expands on decades worth of research confirming that it is possible to live a fulfilled life but that money, a perfect body and design of goods, is not the way to do it. Tommy, your take on it. At the end of the day, things are easier if you've got money. Right. So I think about this all the time because we, you know, we do that conversation in the house. You know, what would happen if we won the lottery, kind of thing, and yeah. you know, how we divvy up the money. I'd and be all found that. face down somewhere <laughs> near the yacht in the station. Right. Uh, but but what, what you realise is. I actually think the psychology is onto something. Before I, before I go, money can facilitate happiness, but the happiness has to be there in the first place. So the facilitation of it is, yeah, you can go do these things and be on yachts or, or you know, eating in nice restaurants. Mm. But unless you're a happy person inside, then it's, mm. you're not going to really, you're not going to really enjoy it. And I think when I think back to the the best, fun, most happiest times of my life. It's nothing to do with money. So you know, it's, you know, as a kid, family parties, you're all sitting on the stairs, chit chatting together with you, you know, with, you, with your family, with your cousins. They were the best times, playing, playing in the street, playing football, playing basketball in the street. Mm -hmm. You know, they were my best memories, and by far, and I don't think I've ever had any, or a roller coaster. You think of those other kind of memories that you've got. Um, Nothing beats that, and, it, and actually, when you go to these lavish places, you must hang out in all these kind of fancy lavish places all the time, Patrick. All your yeah. media friends that you've got, right? Well, you these know, Soho me, mate, bars I'm, I'm and all rarely stuff. out of the Ritz. Right, um, exactly. You, know. you realise actually they're empty, and all those people are lost, and all they're really looking for is a good old time, which comes from things like having a good old sing song yeah. or a bit of karaoke. They're the fun things in life. All right. Well, look, I'm going to um, go now to our, our, our greatest Brits and our, and our Union Jackass. Um, and we're going to have a chat about that. Well, we're going to have a chat about that in a second, actually. But I, I've just been, been presented with a list of your uh, of all of yours, and there are some incredibly good ones here, actually. I must say. So yes, I did want to uh, oh. just tease that for you. There, you can go. And also, your nominations are coming in thick and fast. So I'm actually just going to go to a couple of your views now. Thank you very much, everyone who's been getting in touch throughout the show. GB views at GB News. Dot UK. There's some praise coming in, quite a lot of praise coming in for uh, you two, actually, on the panel, because not, not that people aren't happy with you as well. What? It's specifically... Which you two? Is that, you said you two. The girls? The, the, yeah, the girls, mate. Yeah. They're getting more praise than, than me. On a specific issue, what? which was the way that the people like, quite liked the way that you spoke to our guests from, uh, from the <laughs> OnlyFans community. So there you are. I just thought uh. I'd let you know that, uh, that, that's, uh, that that's coming in. <laughs> um, we've also had quite a few comments in relation to some of the situation going on in Afghanistan in relation to the refugee crisis, etc, etc, etc. I'm a recent widow who now lives alone. This is from Rose. Thank you very much, Rose. Next week, I'm calling on the council to see if I can take in a female and a child refugee. The house is too big just for me. So that's an interesting one, I think, really. I, I quite like uh, the idea of that. There's another one here that I also really like. Hello, handsome. Cheers. Uh, my biggest pet peeve is people smacking their lips when they eat or eat with their mouth open. This was uh, in relation to our pet peeve chat that we had before. I don't like it when people say espresso instead of espresso. I also don't like it when people cycle uh, two abreast or three abreast, for goodness sake, on the roads. We had some other good ones as well. well. Just remind us of what a couple of your pet peeves were. What was your one, George? Bad geography. Bad geography. Yeah. Bad geography. So are you, are you like, can you like pinpoint every single flag in the world and stuff? Are you one of those people? Well, do you mean by pinpoint countries, not flag? Yeah, so you can like you <laughs> would know you would. Not know all of them, flag. but I, I don't know, decent. Not yeah. All of them. Okay. The islands, especially, are quite difficult. Very small islands. You think? Wow. Which one is that? It's a real skill, though. I can't. To be honest with you, I don't even. I'm not even sure where Nuneaton is. Borussia. But I know sure. somebody I don't, does. Yeah. <laughs> what was your pet peeve? My, 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 was, actually, my mind was the food one. People point at your food. Like, oh, you're gonna eat that? You're gonna eat? Uh, what? What is that? Don't yeah. make that face with my food. Make that face with my food. Like, oh, that looks nice. What is that? Just show a bit of curiosity yeah. rather than... Uh, uh, uh. No, yeah. don't Just quickly remind us of what your one as well was there, Sophie. Mine was when people leave empty chocolate bar packets yeah. in the fridge when there ain't no chocolate oh, bars yeah. in there. 
No, that's absolutely shocking. I I'm with you on that. I'm with you on that. Uh, right, we're going to go to a heartwarming story now from the Paralympics. Now, Team GB's husband and wife duo, Neil and Laura Fatchi, uh, both claimed gold today, 16 minutes apart. It's lovely stuff, this isn't it? Scottish rider Neil and pilot Matt Rotherham powered home in 58.038 seconds to snatch top spot on the podium in the men's B 1000 metres time trial, just ahead of compatriot James Ball. 16 minutes later, Liverpool-born Laura then secured an extraordinary story at the uh, Izu Velodrome, I believe is that how you, you maybe pronounce it, uh, as she and partner Corrine Hall defeated Ireland's Katie George Dolveni Dul in the final of the women's B 3000 metres individual pursuit in an unprecedented time of 319.56. So Team GB are currently sitting second behind China with 16 golds and over 43 medals in total. Sophie, do you find it weird how we punch so far above our weight when it comes to sport? Um, as an athlete myself, no, I don't actually. Um, Tell people what it is that you, you do. Um, I'm a football player, um, which is fun. So I'm a centre-back. I play in the FA Women's National League, which is the third tier of women's football. Um, and this country has always really invested in our sports, in our athletes, not only in the physical training of them, but the mental training. And I think it's amazing, as you can see in the Olympics, that a little country like ours, especially in the Paralympics, and that really makes me proud mm. that we're giving these people opportunities that potentially they wouldn't have in other countries. But actually, I'm going to link that back to another topic quickly, because mm. that makes me incredibly sad seeing those athletes having to escape Afghanistan, especially the Afghanistan's women's football oh, yeah. team, because they have to hide and fear for themselves for representing their country on a national level I mean that just makes me absolutely heartbroken as a football player and I hope that we stick by them in our community and global community of sport mm, okay all right well look we are now finally going to do the greatest Britain and the Union jackass so let's, let's find out who they are very shortly Some good ones here, ladies and gentlemen. You are not going to be disappointed. Tommy, going to start with you now. Ronaldo? Yes. Go on. He's my greatest Briton. Ronaldo... Do you understand that? I think there's a lady sat next to you who might have an issue with the geography of what you're saying. No, 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 because he's moving, <laughs> he's moving back to Great Britain, so he is now British. Yeah. Uh, he is uh, our very own Ronnie. Uh, but look, I'm not a Man United fan by, by any stretch of the imagination. I am. Uh, I, you are, are you? I am, yeah. Okay, watch your mouth. But, but, no, but, look, look, the, the, but I am a fan of the English, English Premier League. Yeah. I think it's the, it is the greatest league of any sport in the world is more exciting than any other league. Um, there's, there's, and it's naturally built up to something. You can't create that. Ronaldo could have easily signed an even bigger money deal in other places around the world, and he didn't. He came back to England. Why? Because he's loved here as well, and he's loved at Man. He's loved at Old oh, Trafford. Uh, they still chant his name, and he will be get a, he'll get a hero's re reception. All right. I just, I just think with, with Messi going as well to Paris, we got okay. Ronaldo. And your jackass, very quickly. The jackass who stole Tom Cruise. It, it, oh. it, it, yes. It, it, what is my jackass? My jackass is yeah. The people who stole Tom Cruise's bodyguard's car. I mean, he's Tom Cruise's bodyguard. Yeah. And we, of all the people, what's wrong with criminals nowadays? Do a little bit of research. <laughs> Homework, guys. You didn't do any homework. I will hunt you down. Yeah. Uh, right, Georgia, you're great. Who is it? Um, so this week it's Princess Eugenie. For um, on Tuesday, the 24th of August, she um, took part in a commemoration of it was the 262nd mm. anniversary of the birth of the uh, abolitionist reformer William Wilberforce. Yeah. Um, and she was acting on behalf of her charity that she founded a few yeah. years ago with her friend. Um, that works on modern day slavery, which is unfortunately a very underreported issue. Mm. And actually, there are 40 million people um, estimated trapped in modern day slavery, which is actually um, okay. over twice the amount of people who are in the Atlantic slave trade that Wilberforce campaigned against. Okay, all right. Sorry to rush you through all this now, <laughs> but we've got a lot to fit in. Your jackass. Um, How do you say it, by the way? Is it jackass or I would or say, I, I think, it, you know, it's spelt ass on the screen. I can't believe I just said that. Um, <laughs> but, in, you know, in England we say ass, Americans say ass, so I would say 
ask if I've oh, seen it. Oh, OK. Yeah. <laughs> OK, well, go um, on, talk me who it is. Hopefully it? <laughs> I don't get any Ofcom complaints. No, I think you'll be absolutely fine. Um, <laughs> so my selection is, I suppose, a toss-up between uh, Boris Johnson and Dominic Raab for many reasons, but um, this uh. week, yeah, so this picture is of them in an, uh, a centre dealing with the crisis um, of the evacuation from Afghanistan right now. And mm. just the utter, like, there was just not an inch of compassion in the way yeah. they acted in this video. It was bizarre. Um, it got the thick of it trending on Twitter for obvious reasons. Yes. And it really makes you think, obviously it's a small incident, but it makes you think, why did they think that it was a good idea to act like this on camera in the situation that's happening? It's yeah. bizarre. Well, it's not a great look, to be honest with you. And I think it did go a long way to show that actually potentially they're not always the most sympathetic people, are they, who are running our country? But, you know, we didn't need to be told that, did we? I think it's pretty obvious. Sophie, I've got to be quite quick with you. Uh, who's your great? Uh, greatest Britain is Sarah Story. She won, hey, this was her 15th Paralympic gold medal. I don't think we need to really say anything more about that because that achievement speaks for mm. itself. Fantastic. All right, fine, very succinct. Uh, who's, your, uh, who's, your, who's your jackass? Oh, where do we even start with this lass? Well, it's uh, Gail, the uh, Extinction Rebellion co-founder who exposed her blatant hypocrisy. It's another case of rules for thee and not for me. But not only that, she proved a wonderful point in the fact that her excuse was, well, I can't afford to buy an electric car. So here's the thing, lass, if you can't afford to buy an electric car, <laughs> how can you expect everybody else to? Huh? No. No, it is, it is probably, I think it's ridiculous. Huh? And it's the hypocrisy, and I had someone on the show and they were like, well, you know, look, we're all hypocrites. Yeah, but I didn't, I didn't help found Extinction Rebellion and then continue to drive a diesel car. You know, I thought that was absolutely shocking to be honest. You know, there are some people who just shouldn't drive a diesel car. She's That's one proved, of them. She's just proved that net zero is inaccessible. Well, thanks, Lass. Good point. But it's against your <laughs> agenda, isn't it? Like, what are you playing at? Seriously. Absolutely. Thanks, Christo, for unearthing that, by the way. Absolutely. Well, look, I just want to finish by giving someone a final word here. Margaret's been in touch on emails, gbviews at gbnews.uk, to say thank you very much. Thoroughly enjoying your show. Well, look, it's been great. It's been my first solo flight here, obviously just filling in on Tonight Live for the wonderful Mark Doll. And thank you very much for having me, everyone. I've really enjoyed your interaction. I've loved the show. And hey, guess what? I'm back again tomorrow for another episode of Tonight Live, 9pm. Why be anywhere else? <laughs>